Greetings and welcome to the Department of Tangents Season 2, Episode 2, A Conversation with Musician Janae Halstead. Being an artist often means you spend your life looking for a place that feels right, finding it, and then leaving it as quickly as you can. Creative fulfillment as Brigadoon. In 2021, Janae Halstead released Disposable Love, an album that sounds in many ways like the one she was always meant to make. With producer Dave Brophy and collaborators like Susan Catania, Halstead has crafted an elegant pop album with a sonic palette that spans from her early acoustic sound to horn-driven R&B to something more ethereal. She took some chances to do something different, part of which was allowing herself to sing happier pop songs, which she says can feel way more vulnerable than some of her more folky confessional songs uh, that she wrote in the past. But then she's always kept moving. She recently found a new context in her writing after an ayahuasca ceremony, and she's looking forward to incorporating chants into her next project. That is all covered in this conversation about the arc of her career and the sound of disposable love. Here's Janae Halstead. The new album, Disposable Love, I suppose you've heard this before, is very sort of hard to peg in terms of a sound or a comparison to other artists. How would you describe the the sound and songs to people to to sort of set a baseline for people who haven't heard this this music who might be listening to this now? Wow, that's a hot seat question. (laughs) Just go right in with the, I feel flames coming over me. (laughs) Fuego. Um, I don't know. Like, that's a great question. It mixes genres so much. I would say it's indie folk neo soul i don't know because even <laughs> even in the like folkier sort of sounding songs or i don't even want to say folk because i don't think there's any folk in this but i feel like there's a little bit of like an r&b neo soul tone that runs under a lot of mm-hmm. it but then there's like the noir kind of songs as well like the sort of spaghetti westerning sound the very twangy yeah so guitar I, out in space sort of feel yeah so i just put like someone said oh will daly wrote a thing for sync licensing and and he called it like female fronted dream pop which it's not that but whatever he <laughs> wrote it was like perfect i was thinking yeah. as a description that it, a modern elegant pop sort of fits Ooh, i love that thank you can i use that Oh, yes, please do. Yes. And it, it occurred to me also you that what gives it sort of that noir feeling is that twangy guitar. And listening to this album over the last couple of weeks, uh, I, I sort of realized that that twangy guitar is what some old school country and The Cure have in common. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, it's funny because I both Dave Brophy and I love that sound. Mm-hmm. And like, I don't know if you listen to Anna Calvi. I don't know if you're familiar with her sound. No, but, I, I mean, but I'll check uh, her out. She's so amazing. She's a British like singer, songwriter, rocker. And she incorporates that whole sound into her music and her guitar. And I just think it's it's mostly like the people that I love and I listen to. And so that, you know, it's kind, it kind of has to come in at in every album now no matter what like i have to have <laughs> like that ennio marconi like spaghetti western sound it's just something i love so much but i think part of the difficulty in sort of nailing this down and, and you do have like soul and that noir and, the, and there are some some definitions in between songs where there you know there's there are definite styles but i think part of the difficulty in describing it is that there's not one prominent rhythm instrument there's like listening to this album i don't uh it's hard for me to imagine you sitting down at a piano or a guitar and writing all of these songs it's very much to me a vocal album everything is built around that vocal that's the instrument that carries every song thank you i think that's true and i think that's how i write and that for me is the most important thing when i write is writing for my voice and how do I want to express something in the most sort of whatever way, the most poetic way, the most dramatic way or so. And then everything else has to kind of support that, you know. Mm -hmm. 
do you start with the vocal melody then? Do you start sort of just singing around the house or singing something in the car and then sit down and try to, to, to put an instrument behind it? Yeah, I think like it's usually some kind of chunky guitar. So mm. that's, you know, my go-to instrument. And I think in whatever I'm writing, I'm trying to like find that super yummy melody. Mm -hmm. And if you listen to like the demos of the songs, like they don't really sound anything like what you have on the album, just because like my guitar playing is sort of <laughs> whatever. <laughs> and and I'm like, and I, and I'm like obsessed with strumming. So there's always like too, too much strumming going on, but mm -hmm. I think I'm always like chasing a melody. And then I know it's right when like I'm singing it in the car. Uh, mm -hmm. Like for Mother, Susan and I started, Susan Catania and I, we wrote that song together and we started kind of fishing for that chorus. And I would be like driving through Boston, like singing that chorus. And I was like, oh, I know I have something here because I have that earworm in my head. And so mm -hmm. that's a big indicator for me that I've like found a interesting melody. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, okay, if I can remember this and it's capturing me, then that's something to move forward on. It does. The the music does come out much different. And I, I know from my own writing, I would I would always start with lyrics and then sit down with a guitar and try to come up with mm -hmm. with a melody over a, whatever progression came out. But more lately, I've just been singing things into my phone mm -hmm. and then trying to write something later and it's it, it comes out a lot different the the arrangements are a lot different that way absolutely yeah there's a magic to both sides i feel like the latter is more magic because you're kind of like more focused on like just the sound and the melody and then you're like okay i have to fit the words in mm -hmm. you know but i've done that a lot where i've just written poems and and just writing out like the whole thing like madness was that mm -hmm. for example that was like a poem and i was like how am i gonna how can i fit the chords and the rhythm to work with the poem so yeah some people can do that really well like paul simon can fit any amount of words yeah that he might write over three chords if he wants to he's like really one of my favorite songwriters of all time i just literally was on a paul simon binge this last week and i was like how does he do this it's just so incredible <laughs> and i'm also like how does he write these amazingly beautiful songs and he's such an asshole like, <laughs> i mean supposedly who knows right. but i'm like how does someone write these delicate like heart felt songs that are just so oh some of those lines i'm just like oh my god it's so beautiful yeah, when you get into the the art versus the artist, right, that yeah. can get you in trouble. Well, because it's hard for us to hold two opposing viewpoints yep. that are that are both true. Yep, we are binary people. I mean, that's an issue that you get into in in a Everywhere. couple of in a couple songs on this this album. Yeah. Well, and those are the contradictions that songwriters and comedians and filmmakers are supposed to explore. Totally. Yeah, that's what makes good comedy. There's a, a sort of a complete image of this that that I was thinking about the artwork and I was uh, a, a, as well as the music and how the music is very centered around your voice and all the artwork is, is sort of reflects that as well because it's sort of you in all black and gray and it sort of, sort of focuses on your face. The background is is sort of dark uh, and murky in most of this. If you if even if you look at the cover of the album, mm -hmm. it sort of gives you a clue as to the sound. I mean, is is that deliberate? I'm very deliberate about my artwork, and um, you know, it's a whole thing like buyer beware. Like, <laughs> <laughs> what do you, if you're going in, it's gonna be dark. No, for me, this was a every album. I go through these kind of major like life shifts and healings and this was another sort of like coming out album for me in like a totally different way mm -hmm. and and like it reflects that side of me that is the dark priestess. I love the darkness. I love all that stuff and so it's something I'm very interested in exploring and I think that I think for all artists the artwork needs to represent the the music and I think it's worth investing in just doing it right. You know, well, it is a, a side of yourself that you're presenting 
because mm-hmm. because a lot of the music might be dark. I mean, there there are moments of lightness on here. I don't want to say that this is mm-hmm. just you know completely a heavy album because there are moments yeah. of light on it as well. But I mean, you are trying to present an idea of yourself, a- and a selection of songs is only ever part of yourself. Yes, exactly. It's like the bi- it's exactly what we've been talking about with the binary thing and like. For me, that has been a major theme this year with 2020 and like, you know, last year is like everything on this planet is binary and people Mm -hmm. really struggle when they get too ideal about things. And I myself have really struggled in that way where I've held people on a pedestal and then found out things later where I'm like, oh my God, like Mm -hmm. this person has a, they're, they're like really writing these two extremes. And so I think that, yeah, I mean, for me, that's something I love to explore in my music. Like, that's an absolute freedom for me. Mm -hmm. And I love, for example, like PJ Harvey, because I feel like she rides that so incredibly well. And she's just exploring like the darkness, you know, Mm -hmm. and then you listen to her in interviews and you're just like, wow, she just seems kind of like a normal girl, you know? You said there are certain songs on here that you were kind of afraid to write. Mm. So it's interesting to think about this sort of darkness. Some of the songs that you were afraid to write on here were the were the lighter songs, like mm. Heartlight was one of the songs. Mm. But I think you said you had trouble writing because you were presenting a more vulnerable side of yourself. Yeah. I mean, is that is that as confessional as some of the songs may sound? Is that a a problem you sort of had of trying to remove the artifice from some of these songs and just sing what you mean? Yes. I mean, that's the big I think that's like a big theme at least for me, like it might be for other songwriters too is just removing stripping that artifice down and getting to the core of what you're going to say. But for me, like I think I had this world that was like really hooked on everything going wrong in my life and like Mm -hmm. depression and like all this stuff that once I started to like shift and heal in a way, I was like, wow, I don't have to write everything like sad and depressing and like (laughs) somebody dying and it just being, you know, and so heart, like heart light was like the first time where I was like, whoa, I could write a song about just like being in love with someone and showing them my heart. And that ray of like sunshine that can come out in that expression. And I can just write it. It doesn't have to be, I think also in like the Boston music scene and and also just being a singer songwriter in general, there's this whole bar of like, you have to write like Bob Dylan or Joni Mitchell and it has to be the most metaphoric, amazing song ever. And then pop frees you up because you're like, I can just write what I want to say and it can be straightforward and it doesn't have to be the most, you know, flowery metaphoric you know so Mm -hmm. i think in that in that way it was like profoundly freeing Mm -hmm. to just write like a dance a song that's like (laughs) really fun and just about liking someone and showing them your heart Mm -hmm. you know did that feel vulnerable to do very very vulnerable and i showed it to the person that it was about and he was like "Mm, okay (laughs) He's like, womp, womp. <laughs> I was like, I wrote this song about you. And he's like, ah, he's like into like Queens of the Stone Age and everything. And uh, then I like present this song. And I'm like, dude, if somebody came to me and was like, I wrote a song about you, I'd be like, oh my God, somebody wrote a song. <laughs> but yeah, so it was vulnerable and in all ways, like it was vulnerable to write about like having a crush. Um, I'm like terrified of my crushes. I don't know why. I just have like my whole life. It's been like, I just cave in. So it was like big. It was a big thing for me, you know, just to be like, I have a crush on you. And here's the song. Well, that's like the the junior high lizard brain that never leaves you like that. That's that's it's tough to push yourself past that. It's like your freaks and geeks flashback. Totally, totally. I'm such a nerd that way. You didn't have to to tell the person though, did you? I mean, did you feel compelled no. to present this to them? That well, we were dating. Like we ended up dating, and he was like amazing support. Like he he helped me fund my album. Like he was amazingly supportive, and I was like, hey, like this song's about you. So I did feel like I needed to show it to him, you know. But then it was like vulnerability on a different level because it's like, okay, 
you also have to be okay that like somebody might not like your music. Right. You know, I think it was less about the fact that it was like, oh, this is my song about my crush on you and more about, okay, this didn't hit for him. Mm -hmm. That's vulnerable, you know? But I think also the, the more artifice you put into it, the more layers of protection you have. I mean, because yeah. I, I think you can do a whole show of confessional songs that nobody really knows what the story is. Mm-hmm. And you have that sort of, you have that layer. You, you can walk out and talk to them now and their questions won't be specific enough to put you on the spot about it. Absolutely. Yep. Lyrically, this is much different than I would say where you started. I mean, I went back and listened to the early stuff. And if you listen to the first EP and the the album. The River uh, Grace? Uh, yeah. 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 You, I mean, the River Grace is 2008. And then there's Hollow Bones in 2010. And those both have sort of a country folk sort of mm-hmm. feeling. There's a, there's a lot of acoustic guitar on both of those. And then you get to Raised by Wolves in 2012. And you're starting, I think, to, to move towards the sound yes. uh, that you're at now. Uh, Edge of the World 2015 brings you much closer to that. And uh, it feels like this album, you've arrived in the the sound that you've been trying to get to for a while. Does it feel like that to you? Absolutely. And I think that that's why, like I was saying, the artwork re- represents like another sort of coming out. And that's why I think sometimes it's really important for songwriters to put their face on on their work. And so for me, it was like the whole thing's like in the chair, like I've arrived, bitch. Like this is <laughs> this is it. Like there was so much confidence and so much power in arriving there and working with Dave and helping having him help me craft that and. Dave was like the perfect person for that. Mm -hmm. He's uh, Dave Brophy. He has that sort of genre pegged, you know, like really beautifully. And and he does all sorts of stuff as well. He's, you know, he does like a Klezmer album one day and, (laughs) you know, full R&B the next or whatever. But he, that's, I think he just sits in that world really easily. And Mm -hmm. so making the decision to work with Dave just created so much internal confidence for me as far as almost like no talking it was just like boom yes Mm -hmm. and that was where I wanted like you just said like that was where I wanted to go I'm like a huge Tom Waits fan and actually don't talk about that a lot but I look at his like progression and when he got to Bone Machine and it was Mm -hmm. like oh my god Bone Machine is like the greatest darkest grittiest album ever you that's know not- where, that's where i hopped on uh, yeah. tom waits because i saw him perform going out west on the arsenio hall show and like the next day i'm like mom take me to the mall <laughs> i gotta get that album something about that for me was like yeah i like time tom waits before i grew up on tom waits but when, when that album came out i was just like oh my god it like expressed it like touched something so deep inside of me was there a particular song that you remember off of Earth, that? Earth Lies Screaming. Mm-hmm. It's just like, oh, I've never heard someone like scream and like make all these weird noises with like percussion. And so I think like, I, yeah. I, the I conundrum. think like, that was, a, that was an actual drum that he like made to use. The on that. conundrum. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. I think like, it's like permission. Like an artist gives you permission to be like, I started out in this like, I don't want to say he was folk because he was never that, but it was just this, he was an acoustic singer songwriter. And then he just started twisting into who he really wanted to be. You know, maybe it was the drinking. I don't know. But like, it was Kathleen Brennan. I think mo- yeah, or, or, yeah. Uh, that that's where he started getting weird when they started writing songs together on Swordfish Trombone. That's where the, that's where the German dwarfs start popping up in the, the narrative. Totally. So yeah, I mean, I can't remember what the initial question was, but I think you're right. Like, oh, get this, like finally arriving at a place. Yes. Yeah. And then that opens the whole world up to this more exploration for me. Now I'm like, okay, what more can I do with Neo Soul? Mm-hmm. What more can I do with R&B? What, you know, it kind of like sonically you start to like open up and it's like, whoa, okay. Like I could go into this room and explore. Right, that in the seams is the the big sort of neo soul one uh, yeah. on this. I, I think you'd say they're they're the 
the horns mm -hmm. on it and the, the vocals sort of float over it it kind of sounded it, it, that reminded me of janelle monet uh, thank you thank uh, you you go from song to song and it, it does sound different from song to song there is a center of it but there are different worlds that you're going into like well, let's, let's just sort of go through the first few tracks like i'll yeah. be your man they, i saw you play that acoustically uh, uh, looking through youtube there are some videos of you playing that and it sounds so much different because there's that stuttering sort of rhythm and that dun 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 to it, it that that's not like a it's not a static background rhythm to it i was trying to figure out who the narrator of this song is and who you're singing to and partly because i, I know you and danielle morale are friends i've sometimes hear you singing this to her mm, for, for some reason creepy. Ooh, yeah. creepy. But, but then you know because it's a song of friendship to to me that's how mm. i first heard it but then i saw the video and there are two versions of you in this video. Yeah. You on the couch and the sort of more dressed up in a way that a more formal presentation on mm -hmm. like a velvet couch or something. I think yes. Yeah. And then you sort of out in the wild. Yeah. So now, then it made me think, well, is this a song somebody is th singing to themselves, a song of self-reliance? That's kind of what it ended up being for me once we made the video uh the the song initially dave wrote and it was kind of a country song it was based off another i can't remember the other song that he loves where it's like i know you have another man at home but like i'm your guy if you you know if you mm -hmm. ever end up leaving that guy so that's kind of like where it came from mm -hmm. and he presented it to me and i was like oh this is really creepy and amazing and it could at first i was like this could be like a stalker song mm -hmm. you know I don't know, but for yeah, for me it was like it Single did end up being female remake. Yeah, totally, totally. For me, it's just that thing of like the self reliance and like I'm never gonna leave you. What whoever you are internally, that's the person I'm never gonna leave. But it's, it's a, also like oh, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say it's interesting that the song that that you wrote can change for you over time because I think sometimes you don't know what you've written. No, it's uh, true. Until later, or it just means something different to you in 10 years than it did when you wrote it. Well, really, like not to get too sidetracked, but I just did ayahuasca for the first time. Uh -huh. And uh, I played mother after. And um, it was really interesting. Like I was asked to come up and, and sing like at the end of ceremony, which is really a trip when you've just done 13 hours of ayahuasca and your heart is totally open. But I played um, Deep Dark Sea off my first album, and I was like, whoa, that's not what, oh, this is about something totally different now. And then <laughs> right. I, played, I played Mother from this album the next day, and Mother, I always thought, was like about climate change and all yeah. this stuff. And then doing Ayahuasca, I was like, oh my god, Mother is about Ayahuasca. And like this whole thing that you go through, and the hurricane and the eye of the storm is like, the kind of moment when you're more centered mm -hmm. and you have to be centered when you're when you're drinking the tea or you just get like ravaged <laughs> uh -huh. by by your by your own mind and so it was a really interesting like i was like mother has a completely different meaning for me now well you are someone who has seemed to me to always be in a different place every time i see you uh that that goes for physically because yeah. sometimes you're in yeah. Los Angeles, sometimes you're in Boston, sometimes you're you're back in uh, Spokane, where yeah. where you grew up. Uh, musically, you, you you might be in sort of a, a different place. The, it seems like movement is very much a part of your identity. Thank you. I used to think that was a really not a good quality and not a good trait, and also just kind of hard to pin down genre wise. But eh, I'm like you know. <laughs> It's my life. It's my art. I can explore it the way I want. You know, people are having a hard enough time making money off art, so might as well do what I want. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that that extends to what you do, sort of a, as I don't know if you'd classify it as a day job. Like you help yeah. artists to figure out like where they're going or, or how to process trauma in yeah. through their art as well. That that sort of I don't know. Is it? Would you call that your day job? That's another. Yeah, thing that I think. You do. That's something I'm moving more into and something I'd like to do more. Right now, I think I'm really just helping 
people open their voice. You know, I do a lot of voice lessons and just like, but non-traditionally, really just helping people kind of get into that place where they're okay speaking and they're okay singing and they're okay presenting to the world and and being honest and authentic with who they are. Mm -hmm. But I definitely would, I'm, I'm moving towards more like artistic mentorship because I think that that is like an incredible area to go. Mm -hmm. Well, how, how much of that has to do with your own exploration and, and finding your own voice? And how does it translate when you release an album like Disposable Love, which, which feels like you've gotten somewhere and, and you go back to, to your clients and say, hey, this is how I got to this album specifically. Like, this is what's yeah. going on in my life right now. How do those things sort of work together? I think it's really just giving people permission. So for me, like, I wasn't ever doing this mindfully, but I was just constantly bumping into walls. Mm -hmm. But I was like so determined, I think, to explore myself and just explore like whatever my voice was. And anytime I tried to like sound like someone or emulate someone too much, I would get myself into a lot of trouble just internally. It would, and, and I think externally, maybe it just didn't resonate or hit. But I think when I'm working with people, I try to give them the tools, like small little tools in the toolbox to be like, if you do this every day, I promise you, you know, you're going to get somewhere. And that's really mm -hmm. like the, the repetition is the key. And just being bold, uh, just having enough, I don't want to say confidence because I never had much confidence, but I just was so dogged and like sort of digging in the dirt, like and finding out like what's in there. You know, mm -hmm. I think in my first three albums, I was like terrified to express like what I really was thinking and saying. And a lot of that stuff was not autobiographical. And Raised by Wolves like was semi-autobiographical, but it helped. I got a lot of help on writing with Evan Brubaker, my producer. Mm -hmm. And I think for this album, it was fully autobiographical. And I think... When you're trying to help someone along the, those lines, it's like it's a layered process. Like you have to keep digging, you have to keep getting more real with yourself. And sometimes those those are just like getting some writing tools and just showing up every day for yourself. Well, there's that push and pull between. Uh, I think a lot of artists think about what do people want versus what do I want to make, and I think a, yeah. a lot of times to an artist artist's detriment, they'll go they'll swing too far towards what do people want and then they'll never find out what they're really good at making because of that yeah they yeah i see that all the time and i really like try to get people to understand like if someone comes to me for advice i'm like there's a difference between recording a sound that matches like the current day sound so if you do want to be big on spotify listen to a lot of like what's coming out and how the recording process is working mm -hmm. you know how freaking compressed it is or whatever <laughs> it's not for me but then keep your artistry if you can to yourself and like for some people that works and when it works it hits i think like billy eilish is one of those people like i'm not a huge billy eilish fan Mm -hmm. But she, I do think, is genuinely like she's in her own power as a writer. And then she's aligned, you know, her brother's amazing. And she's really redefined the genre of, the, of, of like the sound. And she's really, it's amazing. But mm -hmm. I think if, if, if you can find, you have to keep yourself intact. Because mm -hmm. it's like even, even more now than ever, like you're not going to get the record deal unless you're like, you know, I and I don't mean to say that like in a negative way. It's like you don't necessarily want the record deal. Uh -huh. Like you're not going to be saved. Nobody's going to save you. Like <laughs> you know, and, and even like Billie Eilish, for example, she puts a song up and it goes viral and it hits. And like it was just a fluke. And then like her whole team actually pulled her back. And like they could have gone like she had like the best people in the industry working with her and they mm -hmm. could have gone like bananas straight from there and they pulled back and then they shelved stuff and then they were very like mindful about how they presented her to the world. And I just think, I don't know, I guess especially for like older artists, just do what you try to find out who you are mm -hmm. and, do, and do what you want to do. 
you know well trying to 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 figure out comparisons for this album and 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 for your music i ran into the idea that most of the people that i would compare you to you didn't really sound anything like them what i was comparing you to what i was responding to was the arc of their career and not the sounds that they're making right now i think you've probably gotten nico case a lot Mm-hmm. as a comparison and that's because probably because there are some it's a very you're both very strong vocally and there are some things that's sort of the only sonic touchstone touchstone i would think mm-hmm. between the two of you but you also both started in a, a very different place than you ended up david ramirez is another one i, I would sort of compare you to in terms of if you listen to his last uh, mm-hmm. a couple of albums as compared to where well the last one's a, a gospel album but the the couple before that he's he went from a sort of an acoustic bass to something that that had uh, you know more drum machines and sort of synthesizers and 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 more modern sort of it's not even modern now they've been using synthesizers since the 60s but you know yeah this is what I run into as a crow. I, I talk myself out of every comparison that I that I make. But you know, there's that that sort of there's that arc that that you've had. Those are the the more apt comparisons for for me when I'm trying to understand uh, what you're doing and where you are. Mm, thank you. I guess that like negates my whole rant that I just did previously. <laughs> what, 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 on what? what do we... my, my rant on like, just do what you want to do because no one's going to save you. But um, no, it, yeah. it, it's yeah. all of those people are distinct and they're doing yeah. Yeah. what they what they want to do. Yeah. A, and they are approaching like they, but if David Ramirez, you could say, did exactly what you said in terms of. Uh, and I don't know that he calculated it exactly like yeah. that. I don't know that he listened to Spotify and and changed the sound of that but he put himself into a new sound yes yeah i i mean i think like sometimes it's like i just want more like whatever i have to do to get more you know i'm already an established artist you know what do i need to do to get myself like in with the kids or whatever but yeah i love to see the arc of a career to me is the most fascinating thing about an artist like Nico Case is just like, wow, I love her so much. And I guess that that's what you're hearing or other people hear is like in comparison to her and the strong vocal, but like her career has been massively inspirational for me. And I think her working with like the new pornographers really shifted her sound, mm-hmm. you know, from being alt country to really just being indie or whatever, whatever mm-hmm. she, she is. But yeah. I think in for Tom Waits, you know, again, like that arc of a of a career is just so fascinating to me. So so now you've arrived at this certain place where you sort of gotten to what you want. Mm-hmm. How do you avoid making 10 more albums that sound like this and getting too comfortable? What do you do next to get yourself to the next place? Well, I'm going to do a mantra album in between so that will get me i think somewhere else mm-hmm. um a so mantra you know, album you said yeah yeah mantra like chant mm-hmm. so you know change the genre uh-huh. well for, okay so for me in the past it was like <laughs> that's a very drastic <laughs> change like a like a monk's chant album that like i, su- yep. I suppose that in the, the you know the early 90s there was some dance music that was also yeah the gregorian chants yeah well okay so i'm like all right i'm done with like the trauma stuff like because that ran my like life for the last like 15 years of just Mm -hmm. like putting myself in situations not good Uh like that informed a lot of my sound was just like my internal like "Ah!" you know (laughs) And I'm sorry you have to you have to adjust the levels after our interview. No, but it's I'm okay. I'm just of, interesting. Know, I have an know. an auto transcription service. <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing what they they uh, what yeah. it makes of that noise. Yeah, like. yeah, um, yeah. And so that's not interesting to me anymore. Like mm-hmm. for me, like joy is interesting and healing and being like a whole happy person is very interesting for me. So yeah, what am I going to do to kind of like still write these confessional 
I, I love the way I write and that's very interesting to me still of writing more confessional pieces or stuff that maybe is darker you know maybe uh, who knows what's gonna happen I like for me I'm more interested in finding different elements of sound now and different mm -hmm. ways of expression so like I'm gonna be doing a Bulgarian folk singing training coming up and so that's very interesting you know like what how when that when i'm done with that how can i incorporate that into a new sound and not like go devastate myself in some way that mm -hmm. you know takes years to recover and really does intervene with my art in a lot of ways that'll be interesting <laughs> to see how that how that incorporates itself yeah yeah i mean because that's the way it has to happen right it has to incorporate itself you can't necessarily mm -hmm you can only sort of half consciously incorporate yeah. it. It has to sort of flow into what you're doing. Yeah. I think it has to fold organically and you know, there's always like, there's tons of fuel for fodder, whatever the word is, the expression is, you know, there's a lot of, there's plenty I can mine from my own past to write about, but I'm very interested in, in that process of, being authentically myself in whatever state I'm in. So mm. maybe it's going to be more happy, joyful. Who knows? Thanks for, for doing this again. Thanks for, for joining me and for, uh, for the interview. I appreciate you uh, joining me on Zoom. Thank you for having me. It was a great conversation. Thanks again to Janae for joining me. You can find her music on Apple and Google and Spotify and all the usual places. To keep track of the new stuff, you can go to www.JanaeHalstead.com and find her on Twitter and Instagram under at Janae Halstead. And that's J-E-N-E-E-H-A-L-S-T-E-A-D. The new album is Disposable Love and I can't recommend it highly enough. If you liked this episode, please consider subscribing on Apple and Google and Spotify and all those places so you never miss an episode. And find more material at www.departmentoftangents.com. And please tell your friends, family, hell, tell a stranger. Spread the links. Thanks for listening. Yeah, yeah.